started. Now tell me what you do with the Bitcoin. I got into Bitcoin when it was uh, $1,400, probably two months ago, something like that. So it's going up fast right now. It's going up like a mofo right now. It's going up, going up, going up. And so I got into it. And now once it, you get into it, what I'm doing is trading cryptocurrencies on Bittrex. You got to get in because the prediction is Bitcoin. Everybody's going to jump in. It's going to be thirteen five by February first. So you think I should I should just go and buy one Bitcoin? Whatever. Buy 10 just Bitcoin. get in, man. Get rid of your cash and get it in a you know like Bitcoin. You're going to make so much money in the next five years. You you'll be so done. You'll be done. Yeah. yeah you'll get be so, into Bitcoin. Yeah. Welcome to the third story. I'm your host Leo Sidrin. You are that person listening to a podcast, and that was bassist and cryptocurrency advocate Billy Peterson on Bitcoin. Folks, the summer is close to an end. It went fast. These are, of course, some very strange times, and strange times often call for strange measures. And I'm not just talking about a bar of 3-4. In my case, I spent the month of July recording a new album in Brooklyn and Paris. It's a tribute to the great and often overlooked singer-songwriter Michael Franks, which I'll tell you more about in the near future. And then I went on the road with my dad's quartet in the Midwest for a couple weeks. The truth is I booked the tour with the intention of capturing the experience and sharing that on the podcast. In addition, of course, to playing the gigs, I wanted to talk to folks who are involved in the jazz life, club owners, musicians, the cats in our band. I also wanted to explore going on the road in the Midwest. This is a path that was at one time very well worn. As I started to plot the route, I began to understand how America itself is laid out, particularly the middle of the country. Every four hours you come to another mid to large size city, and each one had its own musical traditions, locales, tendencies. The way the musicians played the music, the venues, all were a reflection of the places themselves. Minneapolis, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Indianapolis, St. Louis, Kansas City, and on and on. At the same time, the road itself is its own kind of place. It's everywhere and nowhere at once. What is left of these beacons of American music? And what is left of the road? These were the kinds of questions that lit my fire and motivated me to harass and harangue club owners in these towns, to persist and proceed in the face of neglect and ambivalence. Not all of it worked out. While it's true that we have a lifelong contract in Chicago at the Green Mill, Indianapolis passed on our band. Kansas City was already booked, and St. Louis? St. Louis couldn't be bothered to return the calls or the emails. Couldn't be bothered. I'm talking to you, Bob, at St. Louis Jazz. What is your job if it's not to respond? It must have been more work to ignore all those emails than it would have been to just respond and say, not this time, man, maybe next time. You see what this kind of thing does to a person and how quickly. Anyway, today what you're hearing is the first in a series of road documentaries capturing our journey, some conversations about it, and what it means. This episode begins in Madison, Wisconsin, where me and my father, Ben, talk about what we're doing and why. It then takes us up into the north woods of Wisconsin, Sturgeon Bay, where we connect with our bassist and investment strategist, Billy Peterson, our old friend, songwriter, and venue proprietor, Pat McDonald. He was featured on episode 56 last year if you want to go and get his full story. We then travel to Minneapolis where we connect with our saxophonist Bob Rockwell, who you'll get to know better in the next episode. I also checked in with the great pianist Dave Hazeltine on what keeps him connected to Minneapolis even after 25 years of living in New York. He'll also show up again in a future episode. And finally, I sat down with Irv Williams, who, according to Google, is the oldest working jazz musician alive. We happened to talk on the morning of his 98th birthday. And throughout all of this, you'll hear me and Ben considering these events like this. What are we talking about? We're talking about this tour we're about to go on. The tour we're about to go on? Yeah. <laughs> the Rust Belt Tour, a.k.a. the Mob Town Tour. Mob Town. Well, here we are, about to get into a rented vehicle, drive three and a half hours north to hit it off, to start with the tambourine room in... Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, very intimate little club, holds 27 we don't people. Actually we don't even know. We have no idea how many people fit in this room. I remember when we walked in, I loved it. What can I say? It's a great, it's an auspicious beginning. I mean, it's very focused down. It's micro. People have been talking about, like, micro-dosing. This is like a micro-dose. Micro-dose of a gig. I'm looking for a party crowd. I'm thinking 26 crazy party people above the age of 65. So, let's be honest. I... Did this to you, to us. 
Well, I didn't want to say that, but since you said that, yes, somehow you got it in your head that it was a good idea that we do what we used to do like in the 70s. Fortunately, you didn't think it was a good idea to do it in the winter with a B3 organ because you would have gotten a little more pushback on that one. But you decided it'd be a great idea to get a band in a rented vehicle and go on tour in the Midwest. Yeah. Back to the source. There's you go kind, to the source. There's some kind of roots here. I don't know what they are, but we're going back yeah. to those, whatever they right. are. As a matter of fact, the tour could be called the Your Roots Are Showing Tour. Well, I mean, we've got the venues. We've got the mission, which is, of course, to survive and not yeah. lose too much money. We've got the team. This is a refined, finely honed mm-hmm. team. Why do this? Why would somebody do this today, now? What reason might there be? The only thing I can think of is obstinacy. There's this thing in jazz about getting your fair share of abuse. You have to have a certain base level of abuse in order to play this music. You can't just be sitting out in the backyard reading books, taking the dog for a walk. That will undercut your credibility, your authenticity for sure. So you need to go out there and experience what it's like when you get to Cleveland and the guy says, yeah, I know you're big in Paris, but nobody knows you're in Cleveland. And so that gives you perspective on uh, who you aren't, where you are and what you'll be doing for the rest of that day. And then you know what you're going to do that day. But I think that's why being on tour is so great, because it defines the parameters. You know, you just have to stay within these four walls. This is what you do. When you wake up in the morning, you have a task. You have to get somewhere. And when you get there, you have to do this one thing. And it makes life much simpler. I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. That is one of the big attractions to doing this. Because once, as soon as you pull out of the driveway and turn right onto the street, you're in another space. And you're doing your job. And you're doing your job, getting to the gig, checking into the hotel, going to the soundtrack. That's all you're on task. It's, it's reassuring to know there's a way that you could live in your life, get through life just doing that. And you can see how uh, Irv Williams this week in Minneapolis, 98 years old, he's playing a gig. His 98-year-old gig. It's not hitting the high notes, he says. Are but we going to go see him? I hope we're there to go see him, absolutely. It's, he's our hero, obviously. He's, he's still contextualizing his life in terms of the gig. Well, one question I have for him is, does he ask why? Or does he just do it? You'll have to ask him that. I mean, we're, we're as Phil Wood said, we're ninjas out here. We're warriors. I mean, once you get on this road, you really don't want to die with your boots off. And you wonder why I booked this tour. No, it's a way for us to die honorably, I think. No, I don't wonder why you booked the tour. Well, I do. I, why, why would you bother to book this tour? You know, around February, one looks at their calendar. Right, there's nothing out there. There's in nothing in August. Not, August it's just so far away. It's so far away, and it's so just, it's a blank yeah. canvas, it's you a know? canvas, so what could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong with booking a, a Rust Belt tour? Why not try to fill up as many of those little squares on the calendar with a thing? Yeah, that's... With I, black ink. I, I noticed when you were putting this tour together, you were definitely focused on, you know, I got this blank s- square here and God damn it, you know, Indianapolis is not cooperating. Well, exactly. And by the way, I would like to say Indianapolis did not cooperate and St. Louis really did not cooperate. These are some There's some things I'd like to say. Yeah, these people right don't did not cooperate. Kansas City did not cooperate. Didn't come to the party. And, you know, on the other hand, Chicago... Uh, Detroit, Cleveland, these yeah. people were ready to uh, cooperate. Hey, it's, it's really something, you know. In Chicago, we have a lifetime gig. We're standing booked, offer. Standing offer. We're booked for the rest of our lives at the Green Mill. And in Kansas City, in St. Louis, in Indianapolis, we cannot pay them no. to go play in those clubs. No, they would not accept They wouldn't money. accept our money. We got there, didn't we, in the negotiation? Didn't, didn't we say, okay, we'll pay you $100? I'll pay you $100. I'll pay you, and they said no. No, they said no. But so, the, you know, the, the calendar looks blank. You think, this makes sense. What they don't tell you hmm. in school, hmm. in the schools, hmm. in the schools, is in order to go out and lose money, mm-hmm. that's not actually the humiliation. That's the victory. Mm-hmm. The humiliation <laughs> is all of the work you have to do to get that gig. They don't just give you that humiliation. You earn you it. You earn it. <laughs> you earn it. Oh, man. 
No, they don't teach you this uh, in uh, for fifty thousand dollars a year at Manhattan School That's of right. Music. But we could teach this course. We could teach this course on how to be humiliated honorably. Okay, so I'm in a company called USI Tech. USI Tech. I bought in when Bitcoin was fourteen hundred dollars, but yeah. they pay USI Tech pays me one percent five days a week on my investment with them because they have a robot that trades the fluctuation the ups and downs of bitcoin against the u.s dollar right so i make 20 percent a month and i compound that interest now 20 percent a month so you're making 200 percent a year more or less compounding. Yeah, well here's how it works man these geeks come out of the mit and these these engineering schools and they invent these robots that kick the market's ass right started in a somewhat unlikely place, the north woods of Wisconsin in Sturgeon we Bay, talked, Wisconsin. We, we, people have asked me, why? Why? I, yeah. You can't describe it. No. It, it. Talk about local. I mean, it felt like you were where you were, and you weren't on the way hmm. to some place else. I mean, that was a destination for me personally, to put music and energy into that room. I totally agree. I do get the feeling you go over like a bridge and... There's some geographical yeah. boundaries, and once you get up there, yeah. you are outside of the law a little <laughs> Out, bit. Outside of the law. Yeah. I like it. The law of gravity, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> you're, you're in another zone up uh -huh, there. Uh -huh. and, and we found ourselves up there with your old pal, Pat McDonald, and, of course, our boy, Billy Peterson, arrived and made his first appearance of the tour. I mean, come on, man. The guy showed up in a pickup truck pulling a boat, a fishing boat. A day early. A day early. Camped outside. Slept in the woods the night before. It was a sweet scene. And after the gig, you and Billy and Pat sat on the side of the stage and had this great conversation. There, the, yeah. It, there was this moment I saw Billy talking to Pat. They immediately got to Bob Dylan. I don't know how they got there. By the time I sat exactly. down, they were into Dylan. And they were trading <laughs> Dylan's story because, exactly. of course, Billy's got fantastic. the great... Wow. Blood I mean, on the track story. He's the bass player on the Blue. The antithesis of that, because he was so in the in the moment, like he would, he was like kind of like a kid, man. Like I said, well, wow, I got to split the session tonight, man. I got a gig. He said, where are you playing? Really? Yeah. I said, well, so I'm playing at the Long, you know, the yeah. Longhorn, you know, down on down on Hennepin Avenue. He said, oh shit, I'd like to hear you play. You know, fucking, play. you know. He said, I wish I were not recording. I'd come down. I want to hear you play. And what he was so into the input, man. We he listened to the whole rhythm section. He had, we thought he just would steamroll everything, you know, because I mean, all of his the history was so bad with him, man. He he was kind of enamored with that rhythm section. How we pulled his tunes together, how fast. Were you playing? Um, were you playing upright when, mm -hmm. on on those tracks? I played upright on a couple. I think, and, and electric on a few, uh -huh. three, or two, or three, or four. I, I can't remember the record. Yeah. I know when Billy first told me the story, I was like, what? Yeah. Right, because, you know, the record had already, the, they, they printed the cover already. So yeah, they printed the around, cover, so. and so the credits never, uh, we were just talking about that until the in internet came out, and then the yeah. internet said, hey, these ain't these guys on this record. Here's what really happened, and they printed it. And then all of a sudden it became this whole yeah. big thing and there were books written about it. And I just got interviewed again for there's going to be more stuff on it after Dylan got in the Hall of Fame, the Grammy Hall of Fame with that record. You know? And I thought that stuff would never live. You know, That's I, what you, yeah, yeah you said. Because there were, there were the albums he was doing, you know, within that decade, you know, that very, that gen, that, that were kind of like people considered throwaway. But yeah. blood on the tracks is like monumental. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's like considered. That's the one, yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah. that that was that's the one to be on. That's the one to be on during yeah. that. And who would have thought? Who would have thunk it? And, thunk it? And, it, and it was it happened in three days between Christmas and New Year's, man. Right? And it was yeah. colder than hell in Minneapolis. And, uh, <laughs> I thought and Pat, was there, see, the Pat is is a mysterious kind of guy. He, I've told you before, I think he's one of the most gifted songwriters I've ever come across personally. And he's totally quirky and totally unusual. So when he had that hit with Future So Bright, I Gotta Wear Shades, yeah. I knew that a lot of people would hear that in him, not just the people who heard his hit, but the fact that Dylan went right at it like a beacon. Man. Uh, well, my dad was coming into town, and my dad was gonna be, I was I told that my dad was riding in on his motorcycle with his girlfriend at the time. This is in the 80s, the late 80s. You know, my dad, Bob, you know, I was expecting him. And then this woman comes to our dressing room and said, uh, Bob would like to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, dad. I said, my dad. Yeah. Send him in. Yeah, send him in if you can. Can you, can you send him in? He said, no, I think you've got to come with me. And uh, so, okay, fine. Well, I'm following this woman to what I think is some sort of gate where they will allow my dad to pass through, you know. But in fact, Bob is not my dad. Next thing you know, we're going through into Dylan's dressing room and he doesn't have a shirt on and he's like reaching out his hand and we're meeting him and talking to him. and. You know, I kind of just explained, you know, wow, this is weird because I thought I was coming here to see my dad. I was expecting my dad. My dad's named Bob. You know, I guess all my uh, all my major role models are named Bob. You know? and, and he was really gracious. And uh, I don't know, we just talked for a little bit. Barbara was there and then said, oh, we better let you get dressed or whatever, you know, because he was, was getting ready to... To an escape, and um, the next day we were doing our sound check outside on the stage. He came up on the stage in his hoodie, you know, kind of, and came up on the stage, and we, were, and and he was was looking at our gear because what our gear was was this. We had this monolith in the middle of the stage, which was a rack, a big rack that had all of our guitar preamps in it, and our boombox sitting on top of it, you know, that, that was our cause, I really wanted a monolithic band in a box sort of thing, you know, and he was looking, checking that out, and he's like, nah, I'm gonna get me one of these, you know, like, wouldn't have to pay these musicians, you know, you know, he's thinking, and he laughs, you know, it was a joke, but we were doing the song Assholes on Parade. As really? You were doing it then? Our, as part of our set at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And Dylan said, I like that asshole song. I yeah. really like that asshole song. You know, that, that was one thing he said to me. Another thing he said on, in that same, when he was on stage, you know, that was kind of the longest we spoke, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and he also said, uh, you guys are, you guys are kind of like the, the Sonny and Cher of this generation, you know. And I said, thank you or something, you know, like, and he said, no, but I mean, you know, in a, in a, in a good way, like, you know, I mean, there aren't a lot of, you know, male, female duos around, mm -hmm. you know, and there really weren't at the mm -hmm. time, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, it's great here in Leo's daughter yelling back. <laughs> it's it's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a trip. She loves Billy. Billy's her guy. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, good. I got a lot of grandkids and kids, that yeah. little girls, you know. Yeah. Oh, I know how to We've been waiting, girls. and I'm getting go. a headache. Oh, well, let's get out of here. I'm sorry. Wow. <laughs> hey, is your face hurt, too? It's killing me. Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about history written by the survivors. Man. Yes, and at the same time, talk about being huddled around a bonfire in the yeah, woods, in man. In the woods. I mean, we couldn't be more in the woods having that conversation than That's we right. were. Well, you know, uh, the image of huddled around uh, a fire in the woods telling stories comes from Fahrenheit 451. Yes, it does. When they're burning books and knowledge is all about looking at the television screen that's in your house and it can see you too and it's interactive and it knows if you try to read a book and they come and get you and the fire department don't put out fires 
they start fires. It's so close to the kind of things we're dealing with today. It's not even a parallel universe. You can see where an image, a poetic image, can come, kind of comes true here. And at the same time, here we are in a very 20th century yeah. experience. You know, it's both. We're doing both. It's, it's, they're both happening simultaneously. That sounds like a transitional remark to me. Well, y- you're, you're headed right somewhere. That. I'm headed you're somewhere. Where are you headed? I'm on the road. I'm not going anywhere in particular, but I am on the road. And where I'd like to go now yeah. is where we went. To Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Oh, yeah. We went to Minneapolis, and the first thing we uh, collected, the first thing we found, was our friend Bob Rockwell. Bob Rockwell, looking great, right off the plane from Copenhagen, had a couple hours rest, playing bebop in a black suit in a roadhouse on the edge of town, with a huge neon sign that you could see from the highway. It said, Tonight Jazz Bob Rockwell, and then it changed, and it said, Special Tonight $15 Chicken. And Bob was so <laughs> proud. <laughs> he loved it. He made me go out and take a picture of him standing under a sign that said, $15 Chicken. Well, hey, man. That's the kind of gig that was. It was a great gig. That was a nice scene, and that's where I caught up with Dave Hazeltine to talk to him about how he found himself as a member, a, a uh, honorary family member, An honorary of, family member of the Petersons. Let me ask you a question. Can I ask you a question? Leo, Leo. You can ask me anything you want. Let's talk about Minneapolis. Let's talk about you, your relationship with Minneapolis, and these cats, because these are this is like a reunion for you. It is. It is. It just goes back to uh, when I was seventeen, I think, or eighteen. Uh, that's when I met Billy. Uh, when he was coming down and training in Milwaukee, because in Milwaukee they had a, this is the only uh, Olympic sized speed skating rink in the uh, area. So he would come down there and train, and that's how I met him. And uh, he came into a gig with a bunch of his speed skating buddies one night, dressed up like a jock, the Speedos and the tat. He looked like an, looked like an, I mean, to jazz musicians, he looked like an idiot. Yeah. And we were young, <laughs> and, and we were like, he said, hey man, I play the bass, can I play some? It's like, wow, this is so weird. But we, you know, we said, oh, why not? And then we were just, it was jaw dropping, like, what? <laughs> you know, this guy, right? Freak of nature. So that's how I met Billy, and that's how I got to know Billy. And then I think it was the next year when he came down, we, I hooked up some gigs for him and whatever, and he, he came down, he said, man, Will you come up and play with Eddie Harris with me? Huh. You know, and and, ha- and spend Thanksgiving with my family. Wow. You know, so that's when I first met all of the other Petersons. Went up there, you know, and met and had Thanksgiving dinner. They took me in. I, it was like I was part of the family. His daughters, you know, really gorgeous women. You know, they were in here last night. They were like three years old. Yeah. And Billy's got pictures of me, you know, standing over them at, I think I was like, 17 or 18 at the time and we I came up here and did this Eddie Harris thing and Eddie ended up calling me for more gigs after that so Minneapolis has just been good to you in general very good you know and that's then I met Kenny and you know all the guys up here and even after I left uh, Milwaukee and moved to New York they still I still came out here and kept a connection to these guys and 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 it's a very warm you know you asked about Minneapolis it's a very warm place you know, and um, I feel close to all these guys. And, 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 and Bob Rockwell was, of course, part of that uh, configuration, too, because he was always coming back. Thank you. 
Bitcoin lives on the blockchain, and everybody says, "Well, where is it? The, where, where's the money? There is no money. There is no money. No, I understand that. Yeah, but and but, Bitcoin but, is what they're using to buy heroin, you know, and, and the dark net. net. The dark yeah, net. They the can't dark track net. it. Sure, they're yeah. gonna, it's going to be all over. But yeah. so what? Yeah, exactly. That's right. <laughs> Cats they're not the using bank. dollars to buy heroin. Of course. They're. Guess what? China. Yeah. They're going to make make it a legal currency. South Korea just made it a legal currency because people. In third world countries, guess what they have? They have cell phones. Yeah. They don't have bank accounts. That's right. Here's your bank account. That's right. I read that. So I'm going to buy one Bitcoin. You should buy one Bitcoin. And start. You should have bought one I did. No, I know. But that, but it's still going up. Ben, you want to go in with me on Bitcoins? Well, I, 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 I want to clear one thing up. And sure, that is man. this company that is using your Bitcoin. Yes, they go and they trade your money on the open market. That's Billy Peterson on the benefits of trading Bitcoin on the open market. If you're a loyal Third Story listener, you may remember Billy from my Welcome to Copenhagen episode a couple years ago, where he told us about another scheme to build manure drying machines. If you're not a loyal listener, now's as good a time as any to correct that. Third-story.com is your place to go. Check out previous episodes, sign up, leave a message or a review, get hooked up, poke around. Much like the road itself, Third-story.com is both a destination and a way of traveling. Before Billy was a world-class investor, he was a burning bebop bass player, the son of Minneapolis, the son of two fine musicians, brother to four more, and a disciple of saxophonist Irv Williams. As we mentioned earlier, Irv is now 98 years old. According to many, that makes him the world's oldest jazz musician. He represents the hope in many ways, the best-case scenario. One might be tempted to believe that he continues to play his saxophone regularly simply because he's still alive and because he can but I prefer to believe that he's still alive because he plays and because he cares to. They say the music can keep you alive, but maybe it's actually the desire that does it. He's lived a long life, born in the South, settled in the Twin Cities in the early 1940s, nine children and God knows how many gigs. So, of course, the details can get fuzzy. What he remembered clearly was his early childhood and his most recent gig. The in-between details fade a little. Maybe they don't really matter at this point. One name that still rings out in his mind is trumpeter Clark Terry, with whom he shared a long friendship. That relationship figures heavily in our conversation. Just imagine what it means to be a jazz saxophone player nearly a century old. It means he was born shortly after the word jazz itself started being used. It means he was already touring in territory bands in the South and had a sound of his own before he ever heard the word bebop. It means the American songbook was written around him. It was new when he started playing the music, and as he says, he's still thinking of crazy shit to play on it. It means that he's outlived some of the musicians that he personally influenced. Here I tell Ben about the experience of going to meet with Irv, and then I take you with me into the old folks' home on Irv's 98th birthday and find out how it feels. So I stopped to see Irv Williams on my way out of town. Yeah, how was that? Well, what was great about it, you know, he's the oldest no, I mentioned it. He's the oldest jazz musician alive. I actually tried to see him the day before. Yeah. He had made an appointment. Mm -hmm. I called him. I love this cat. He's 98 years old now. When I, when I first called him, he was still only 97. Mm. Picked up his cell phone and answered it. Yo! And I, I said, it's Leo Sitter. Hey, man, I have it. How you doing? I'd like to come interview. Yeah, it'd be great. Okay, why don't we do it at the old folks' home? When is good for you? Anytime. Mm -hmm. Two o'clock tomorrow, that sound, sounds good? Okay, good. I'll be by at two o'clock tomorrow to the old folks' home, and I'm going to talk to you, Irv. Sounds good. I show up at 1.45 the next day, as we had scheduled. He's nowhere to be seen. So I called him on the phone once again. Did you call? Yeah, it's Leo. I, I think I'm in your building. Oh, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on the highway. Is that supposed to meet you or something? Oh, yeah. I was going to meet you. It's Leo Sidron. I Turned out by your place and, uh, talk to he you. had a gig. It's double booked. He double booked himself. I mean, I can't think of a better reason for him to be unavailable than a gig at 97 years old. Well, just a gig anytime. <laughs> at so. any time, really. Right. That's a universal musician's yeah. excuse. Yeah. I had a gig. I had a gig. I had a gig. 
So I ended up going to see him the following morning, and as it happened, it was his 98th birthday. I spoke to him on his birthday, and it's I like went... A, like a Mel Brooks scene. I was unbelievable. You were interviewing the 2,000-year-old jazz musician. That's right, and instead of saying, oh boy, when I asked him, is it true? Yeah. I said, is it true you are the oldest jazz musician alive? And he said... I don't care. I got to get old some way. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think about that, man? What do you think when you hear that? I don't that? give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> I get out there and do the best I can. <laughs> That's a jazz musician's answer. That's right. I loved it yesterday when we tried to get together. Uh -huh. And it didn't happen because you had a gig. And at 98 years old, the fact that you had a gig that you forgot about, I thought, <laughs> what better reason, there couldn't be a better reason for having to reschedule than that you have a gig. Well, you know, I, um, I, I just can't uh, quit. I, I should quit because I'm not playing well, you know. I should, I should just get out of it, but I can't do it because it's part of my life, you know. Man, whatever you play... From now on, every time you put the horn in your mouth, it is a gift. It is a gift to everyone around you that you're still playing. Uh, well, I'm glad you feel that way because <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I mean, you're the oldest jazz musician alive. Did you ever think somebody would say that to you? Uh, I would think somebody wouldn't say that to me. I, I, don't, I don't ever think about it. You know, I just want to go to the next gig and 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 do it clean. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to sit up there and just... And it hasn't happened yet, you know. But yeah. when it happens, then I just quit, you know. But I get up there, and I can still think of crazy shit, you yeah. know, and everything. And Irv, where were you born? I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, on that date. <laughs> on this date? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, my mother died in pregnancy uh, with another kid. I was born, and they, my dad wanted, my dad was a doctor, and they wanted her to uh, abort this kid because um, she had, had trouble with me. And uh -huh. I, was, I was in the hospital for, oh, I think for six months. They were p fixing parts of me. <laughs> right yeah. after you were born? Right after I was born, they were fixing parts of me. They didn't think I was going to live either. So my dad said, no, no, no. She says, no, God's going to take care of me, as my mother said. And it didn't work out that way. And so um, I was without a mother, and I was a little over six years old. I was fixing, just fixing to go into kindergarten when she died. Do you remember her? Do I remember her? Well, I got a picture of her, you know, right, right up there. A picture mm -hmm. of her and my dad, right? And they were marvelous people, yeah. He was a doctor, and she was a piano teacher, uh -huh. yeah. I was sent off to Cincinnati, Ohio, with my grandfather and grandmother to um, go to um, grade school. And I finished the um, fourth grade, finished the fourth grade, and then I went back to um, Little Rock, Arkansas. So that's a brief... Um, <laughs> overview. <laughs> overview, yeah. <laughs> When did you start playing music? My mother was a um, Indian, small tribe. Uh -huh. She uh, played piano. She graduated from uh, a little small college in Little Rock, Arkansas, and so she was teaching the piano. And uh, my grandmother bought me uh, Indian food about that long, I guess, hmm. something like that. And so all the everybody says, oh, he's got it. Indian With flute. just hearing you play the little Indian flute. Yeah. <laughs> and I was playing that thing all over the house and everything, and outside and everything. So my gra grandfather I came in. He was in, in town. He was working for the Methodist Church. When he came into town, he was saying, oh, how cute that is. And he, he was in town for uh, a couple of weeks, and by the time the, he... The second week was around, he was going crazy, you know, because I was playing the flute. <laughs> and my mother, uh, you want me to turn turn him off? Huh. And my my grandfather said, no. He says, I he says I 
I see, I hear some music in that kid, you know. So, so let him go ahead and do it, and I go outside. And so, this is before you were six. This is yeah. five or mm -hmm. five yeah. years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had I I was playing violin when I was seven years old, and my sister was eight years old, and we had a duo. And we go to all the churches, you know. Care, we don't care about denomination or like that. And we yeah. play, and we were, we were cuter than it was music. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but everybody showbiz. Yeah, so I've been involved in music all my life, you know, one way or the other. You know? When did you pick up a saxophone? I was in Little Rock, and I passed by this pawn shop, and my I went back. I said, Grandma, what's that? She said, that, that's a saxophone. And so I couldn't see the word. You know? So I looked and then we left, and then I, it was on my mind all the time. So when my grandpa came back to town, uh, I, I told him, uh, I'm gonna go back and see Horn. Horn? Yeah. She's, he says, what? I said, it's Horn, I wanna see the Horn. Where is the horn? And so she told him where the horn was. So they went down and got this alto, Holton, sandblasted silver finish. They bought this alto, and of course, there was noise from then on. And a guy um, who's a band leader in that area, he had a, a black man that was a um, territory band. Mm -hmm. And he taught me, and gave me lessons, and showed me how to the keys and everything like that. And, and what? But around how old were you? Do you think when this was happening? I was about ten, eleven years old, something like and that. And this was your teacher, yeah, your mm -hmm. teacher. Yeah, Bill Holloman was a wonderful guy, wonderful teacher, and he had a territory band that he carried around in mean, Arkansas, Texas, Mississippi all the southern states and everything. And most of the time it was about 10, 11, 12 pieces. Did you join his band? Uh, no, I wasn't good enough, uh, but I used to join him by listening to him and yeah. sitting, in the, sitting in the read section and stuff like that and watching and everything. Yeah. And so by the time I was uh, 16, I was blowing my ass off, you know, and people didn't, Where'd you get that boy? <laughs> mm. Mm. But mostly by ear. You know, I, I wasn't picking around with the music at all. You know, I, I learned how to finger it and stuff like that, and they showed me some music. I, you know, I want to play. You know. Sure. How old were you? You weren't that old when you moved up to Minneapolis, right? I moved to Minneapolis. Man, all this stuff starts getting to be hard to I, remember. I read that you moved here in 1942. Does that sound right? Yeah, that's about right. So you were still a pretty young man in, yeah. your, in your 20s. Yeah, that's right. And had you been spending time with other bands before you yeah. got here? Yeah, I, I, was, I was playing with um, this band from San Antonio, Texas. Uh -huh. But it was a territory band. It was, all, all, man, those guys could blow. Oh, it was outstanding. I mean. Tell me about a ter what territory bands were and what it meant to be in a territory band. It meant a lot of traveling, a lot of uh, racial stuff goes on sometimes with uh, the white women following the band around and stuff like that. And, and so if you were in a, in a Texas territory band, that meant that you would travel around the south, yeah, around right. Texas? and all that area. And, and you're playing and, in black uh, venues? Uh, mostly, yeah. Uh, we played some white country clubs down there. Uh -huh. And they would like us, and we'd go back and everything. It was, it was difficult, you know. Who were you listening to? Who were your favorite saxophone players back then? Oh, there were so many saxophone players, man, that the black saxophone players were blowing their asses up, mm -hmm. you know. I think I like um, Don Bias mm -hmm. uh, the best because he went to school, learned how to do it right and everything, and he taught a lot of the people. Then there was Dick, what was his first name, with uh, Andy Kirk. And he was a uh, very nice looking guy, and he was messing around with Mary Lou Williams in the, in the Andy Kirk band. And so I used to sit in the Andy Kirk band. In the summertime, I'd go on trips with him, 
and he'd play my alto and everything. And so I got a, just a great introduction into jazz with, with being at Andy Kirk, you know. And back then, you would hear musicians in person more than listening right. to them on record, right? right? Mm-hmm. Like, like uh, Don Bias and um, Dick Wilson was along with Andy Kirk. Mm-hmm. That was one hell of a band. It was just mm-hmm. outstanding. Mary Lou Williams was writing all of, most of the charts. Mm-hmm. Summertime, that's, that's where I would go, you know. My dad would let me go, and I would sit in, and they, and they were in charge of me. Man, I had so much listening to these guys that I was just, when I went to high school, I was a motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> You were, you were already playing. I'm telling you, I was blowing everybody away, man. <laughs> so when you came to Minneapolis, I mean, eventually you settled here. You stopped moving around and you... Because of a woman. Yeah. So what? <laughs> <laughs> I was with um, Earl Hines mm. from Chicago, and I came here. I met a girl, and I said, well, I wanna, I'm going to come back, you know, and if I get a chance... And so I did come back with great trumpet, but I can't think of his name now. Damn. <laughs> so I've heard that over the years, you got offers to go back out on the road to go join bands. And oh, yeah, but I had kids then, and I couldn't, you know. I sit down sometimes and to say, why did I go? I just couldn't leave, you know. I just, I loved the kids and everything. I, I wanted to see them grow up. How many kids and, do you have? Wait a minute. I got to count them. Okay. <laughs> I can't. Okay, you're right. Outlaw. Stand. Ooh, man. You want a hand? No, I'm okay. These are, here are my ancestors. Oh, that's my grandfather, uh, Dr. Ken. I'm sure glad I got pictures when I did. These are two sets. This is of my grand, what am I trying to say? Grandkids? Uh, Great grandkids. Grandkids, no, grandkids and kids. Now this is this is a kid. I mean, this is one right. Yeah, the older kids now. This is another one right here. Yeah, two. And this is another here. Yeah, no, no, this is a kid from Africa that I, that I adopted. Uh huh. Well, I actually saw five of them. I can't yeah. see them. Oh, here is my oh. boy. Oh yeah, up there. That's it. Yeah, I'm gonna hang this back up on your wall. Okay, thank you. Herb, huh? I can't believe it, man. What? Well, you may not know this, but you have a photo here on the wall of you and Clark Terry playing together about 15 years ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I played drums behind you that day, and that's my knee right there. Oh, I was yeah. playing. <laughs> I played that gig. I'm on your wall, man. That's I'm great. Right man. there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So you ask yourself sometimes, why didn't you go? But I understand perfectly that you had a family and you wanted That's to it. be here. So what did you do to make a living aside from playing? Did you have to get other jobs? Yeah, I was in the dry cleaning industry. I was working um, the big hotel down in St. Paul. Uh-huh. Hilton. Hilton, yeah. I was at the Hilton for off and on for 15 years. The last time I, I was there, I was I was there for... 14 months. When do you think this was? Around when? It was in the 50s. Uh-huh. I know that, yeah. That you were dry cleaning and yeah, playing at playing the Hilton. at the Hilton. I got all those kids during that period of time. You know? And you were working hard. Yeah, I was working hard. I look on your wall at all of the Hall of Fame celebration that the city over the years, the Twin Cities, have come to recognize how important you are to the community and mm-hmm. the fact that you're still here. And it makes me wonder if living here and deciding to stay here and raise a family instead of going on the road is part of what's kept you young for so long. I think so, because that road is hard, you know, but I worked my ass off. But it was a clean living and uh, loving kids and stuff like that. It was a uh, great part of my life at that time. So that's the reason why I'm in better health than most of the guys Clark is dead. It was a blow, I tell you. I really yeah. Did. He called me on the telephone. He says, Herb, um, come on, come on down here. And he used to come here at least once a year and try to get me to go with him, you know. 
And I said, man, I got kids and stuff like that. I would like to. So I went down to Chicago with him uh, for New Year's. What year? I don't know. I don't know. I won't even so, ask. But you think 50s, 60s? Yeah, it was 60s. Yeah. So I went went down there and played New New Year's with him at the, at one of those joints. I can't remember the name of it. It was just a great thing, and people thing. And so then I went over to Clark's house with him with with his wife. She used to be a nurse. We sat around. And he, so Clark says, "Well, I get you a job on the uh, radio." I said, "No, you won't." I said, "I'm staying here." Mm -hmm. He says, man, come on, we got it. You know, let's let's do it. I said, I said, I I can't do it because I got a family, you know. So then he would come here about once every yeah. six months, something like that. You read? I said, hell no, I'm not ready, you know. And it hurt to do that, you know, because I'd known him so many years and everything, and and to play with a superlative musician would have been great for me, you know, for every night, you know. So he called me and I uh, hinted around that he was sick, you know. I hadn't heard anything about it and everything. And he says, um, can you take some time off, you know. I said, for what, you know, to see me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, why don't you see me, you know. I met Clark Terry when I joined the Jeter Pillar Band. I used to meet him in the, in the union, and uh, he came around. He says, do you practice? I said, yeah. He says, why don't we practice together? I said, yeah. So we started practicing together, and we used to have these short coats, you know, and we'd w walk up down to, to the uh, school and back. And all the girls would say, kitty, 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 when they see these short coats. And we thought, oh, man, that's so great. You yeah. Know? Clark would have this music book, and we'd go down, most of the time we'd go down before class, and uh, he'd open this book, and we'd be play out in the book. And, man, I just couldn't keep up with him. You know, i just not able to keep up with him. And he was looking at me, come on, man, what the hell are you doing? I said, take this book and learn it. <laughs> so uh, gradually, you know, I learned how to stay up with him and everything. And uh, we did an a arrangement that he um, had composed for assembly. And uh, it went. Man, when he first showed that to my son, I can't play this. I must have re rehearsed it at home and at school and anywhere I could rehearse those different passages that I just wasn't able to, to do. We had played assembly once. And we played this tune, and it just went over so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but Clark came over. He says, um, you know, that's the best you've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, man, I didn't play that. He said, hey, yeah, you're getting it. You mm. know, so I got it. And I finally got it. And so we had four or five very difficult tunes mm -hmm. uh, playing together, trumpet and tenor sax mm -hmm. and everything. And so we did that. You were playing for a long time before bebop really came on the scene. Yeah, I was. What yeah. did you think when you first heard bebop? I liked it. I liked the heck out of it. At some time or other, bebop and dance music all it seemed to converge on one thing, melodic, more of a melodic thing, you mm -hmm. know. And that's when I joined, you know. I claimed I didn't have the technique to do all that stuff that they were doing. I joined a band, um, they call themselves the Yellow Jackets, and the leader of the, Jack leader of the Yellow Jackets was Chester Lane. Okay. And this was because of me that Terry came down one summer into, into uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. He came down and he stayed there one summer, and that was when I jumped the fence. You know, to the I other was, side. Yeah, to that side. In terms of the way you played. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So being around Clark, you think that was part of it when he came in to join that band? That was a period when he... Yeah, mm -hmm. because he wasn't playing bebop or anything like that. It was um, I can't explain his music, you know, but uh, because he played commercially, yes, uh, you know, but some of his comp compositions, everything it was, yeah. a, it was a jumble of. I used to say a jumble of shit, you know, <laughs> but it wasn't, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I jumped from Coleman Hawkins and Don Bass and all that stuff to somebody else. Yes. You know. Now, I now I don't play like anybody now. You play like you, Herb Williams. Yeah. It can be bad at times and be good at times. But it's always Herb Williams. <laughs> That's right. If it's bad, it's Herb. <laughs> what do you think about the way the music has changed over the years and the the way people listen to music now. Like you say, when you started, they were dance bands, mm -hmm. right? They were entertaining yeah. bands. Mm -hmm. You have to go to hear a dance band to yeah. get, hear anything to, that you could dance to. Yeah. Well, you know, what what, the, what what it seems like they're doing now, the music is, um, I can't describe it. Uh, uh, down there where I, where I play on, on Fridays, I go in sometimes to, to watch who, who he's booked in, you know. You still play every Friday? Yeah, I play every Friday. Yeah. Where, at the Dakota? Where do yeah, you play? Dakota. The early set at the Dakota, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You still play every Friday? Yeah, still there. I don't know, I'm going to admit it, I don't know what they're doing. They get out there and there's no time, uh, you know, like one, two, three, but it, go, it goes one, two, three. <laughs> and I, I sat up there and I sit, sometimes I sit down and watch and I thought, uh -huh. <laughs> where's one? Yeah, <laughs> where's <is>. two? <laughs> it's, the feel has changed for a lot of people. Swing feels different now. Yeah, it sure does. The way they're putting it feels different. Yeah. You know? But that's why I think you're a real ambassador right now, you know? You, you've you seen it all for yeah, almost sure 100 have. years. <laughs> I've seen it all. It's weird. Do you practice? No. I'm not going to waste as old as I am. <laughs> I go waste my t the short time I got left. Well, you know, I just, I don't practice. At times when I have a bad night, I come home, I say, well, that's it. I'm going to practice, you know? And I don't see that on until I play again. You know? What does it mean to have a bad night? What do you mean when you can't you can't play what you hear in your head? Yeah, you can't play what you hear, and your fingers all come together like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I learned from you when I played with you, and when I've heard you play, is you can say a lot in a short amount of time. You know, you could play one chorus or two choruses, and there's nothing that was left unsaid in those two choruses. And I, I always think that's the lesson as you get older in this mm -hmm. music. Yeah. You learn how to be more concise. That's right. Because it, it, I'm playing with, um, what's his name? He's a good guitar player. But he does not, he's afraid of making a wrong chord. Mm -hmm. He always tells me I'm playing wrong. I said, tell, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, right. When you start playing right, then you should yeah, work. Yeah, right. <laughs> Irv, thank you so much for taking oh, your birthday you, morning. I so appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
Bitcoin is being traded on the market yeah. every day. Yeah. It's a huge fluctuating, and the more it does this, the, the, the shark's teeth, the more that robot works and the better. Yeah. Ups and downs. So I make money on Bitcoin whether it goes up or down, and all it's doing is going up. I'm going to have so many Bitcoin, Ben, and it's going to be worth it. They say in, in, in 10 years, it'll be worth a half million dollars. A Bitcoin. One Bitcoin. What you're touching on here is the fact that history is written by the survivors. And a lot of history gets lost. And the fact that Irv Williams is 98 years old and the oldest living jazz musician is celebrated in his hometown is fabulous. He didn't get lost. He lives on in the memories. Right. And, so, and, and it raises a, a big question, for a bigger question for me about what the goal is here. You know, I mean, in... Irv's case, he clearly chose life over, you know, any number of things he might have chosen. Like, never mind going on the road, he didn't seem particularly interested in uh, being particularly famous or playing in a famous band or even making a contribution beyond his immediate surroundings. I mean, he touched personally Mm -hmm. and affected personally the people he influenced and affected. Mm-hmm. And he did it both through his playing, but also through the kind of person that he was. And that was the choice that he made. There's something very beautiful about that. Now, we celebrate him today because he's the oldest living jazz musician. He's the <laughs> world's oldest jazz musician, right? And that's an amazing feat. But I think that to an extent, when I ask him, how does it feel to be the oldest jazz musician alive? He says, I don't give a shit. Mm-hmm. Because he wasn't motivated by that kind of thinking. Mm-hmm. He wasn't motivated by I'm, you know, I'm going to be the baddest cat around. He just wanted to put the horn in his mouth and play. The biggest concern that I heard from him was, you know, just he just wanted to hang on so he didn't have too many bad nights. You know, mm-hmm. he's 98 years old, and his biggest, really, his biggest preoccupation is I just want to be able to play pretty good. Well, and that's the other thing about we're talking about territory bands or regional music is after a while, people come to know you. Locality is created by the locals. <laughs> that's what it is. Well, that's an interesting thing, man, because we are on a regional tour right now <laughs> by design. Yeah. A tour that many people have gone on oh. over the course of the last hundred years. This is like where you crawl on your knees across Spain to visit the places. In right, <laughs> you're talking about the uh, Santiago... Yeah, uh, yeah. The Compostela path, right? Exactly. And you stay in the in the monasteries every night. You, you stay sleep in the on the floor, and you know, and you touch the rocks that have been the stones that have been uh, have been That's polished very, by. It's very similar. You go to the joint. Jazz clubs are like outposts. No kidding. Like and, Fort Apache. <laughs> yes, and the musicians are like uh, pilgrims. Like pilgrims, and as Phil Woods would say, and soldiers. Yes, and knights yes. of some previous code. Yes, especially today. Yeah, especially today. Well, then why would somebody sign up for this? I mean, boy, we are like Don Quixote, man. We really are. I mean, we're out here talking about what this music means, and it's... But you just said it. We're out here looking for meaning. There it was, Mob Town Tour Chapter 1, The Search for Meaning. Tune in next week for the second chapter, where, among others, you'll meet this guy. You want them to shut up, listen to the music, be respectful, but you also want their money. You know what I mean? You can't throw out everyone that talks because you'll go broke. I'll be back next week from Chicago. In the meantime, I'll talk to you soon. Oh, and one more thing. I'm, bu- I'm buying some fucking Bitcoin, man. Do something that doesn't change your life. If you buy one Bitcoin. I'm going to buy one Bitcoin and see what happens. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You're going to do it. You're going to buy a Bitcoin. <laughs>